So, and then ultimately the biggest question is, okay, again, IVF we know is wrong. You know, maybe there's some clear boundaries there, but what about all these other sort of unique interventions that are out there? There are things like gamete intrafallopian transfer or intrauterine in insemination, or you're going to be using insemination from the husband so that, you know, it's not actually a donor gamete, but it is the couple's own gametes. And, you know, you start to wonder, even as a Catholic, like, well, well, on what grounds do are we able to discern and assess each of these particular methods above and beyond, well, IVF is wrong, you know? So that would be the the kinds of dilemmas that they might be faced with or questions they might be faced with is, you know, hey, I get that IVF is wrong, but what about all these other things? I'm here with John DiCamillo, ethicist and personal consultations director at the National Catholic Bioethics Center. John, welcome to Brave New Us. Thanks, Samantha. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Would you briefly introduce yourself and explain the work that you do at the NCBC? Yeah, certainly. So my name is John DiCamillo. As you mentioned, a personal consultations director now at the National Catholic Bioethics Center. I've been a full-time ethicist for 12 years. And the work that we do at the NCBC is basically we do research, writing, publications, education in the area of Catholic bioethics. And in particular, the biggest area I'd say of our work is consultation. So we do both institutional consultations for Catholic healthcare, for bishops and dioceses, and we also do personal consultations for the average Catholic healthcare providers who may have questions about how to apply the church's teachings in the situations they're facing in daily life. Yeah. And, and can you say a little bit more about those? And I believe those are free. Is that correct? That's right. Exactly. So we've had this uh, free consultation service for decades, and now it's actually a, a new thing that just as of this past year, we have a whole department that we've built up around it that I'm heading up in order to try to expand that service and reach many more people because so many people don't know about this great treasure that we have, yeah. which is you really can call up and send us an email, go to our website, you can submit a question, and it's totally free of charge. So anyone can do it. If you have questions about end of life issues, for example, proportionality of treatment, nutrition, and hydration, get a lot of questions in that area, probably a good 25%. Then we get questions about all sorts of other areas from beginning of life uh, to the end of life. We got contraception, sterilization, procreation related questions, as well as complications of pregnancy and how to handle those, what can be done, particularly in tragic cases where the child might die, but, but where it's not a direct abortion, which would of course be immoral. So there are all sorts of fine distinctions around that, and the cases can get very complex and nuanced. And so, you know, a lot of times people who are familiar with the church's teachings, they know generally, well, of course, the church says abortion's wrong. Well, of course, sterilization's wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't necessarily know, wait a minute, now, what does that mean in this case I'm in right now? How do I actually apply that? And sometimes they'll find themselves in a situation where even if they ask their parish priest, the priest may have also an idea, but he's not entirely sure. So we actually get a number of calls from parish priests who ask us for assistance with advising their parishioners on how to navigate their particular circumstances. So that's what I'd say is unique about our free personal consultation service is that we're actually able to provide you with real-time, case-specific moral guidance to assist you in trying to make your decision, how to form your conscience with respect to a particular decision you have to make. And we're bringing all of our ex expertise, all of our ethicists, all of our years of experience and the church's documents and teachings to bear right then in the moment when you need it to make a tough decision. That is just an incredible resource. Thank you so much for heading that up and, and being a part of the team that makes that happen for people. I'm sure there are people listening who are, are thinking, oh, well, that's great, but I don't want to bother them with my particular <laughs> you know, circumstance or whatever it is, even though this question is really troubling me. What would you say to that listener? Oh, I would say absolutely give us a call or, or submit an email through our website. It's ncbcenter.org. No worries. We're actually building up. So part of what I've been doing this past year as the first time director is bringing in more staff. We have a team now of interns and ethicist fellows who are assisting with responding to questions, particularly through the email system. All of our phone calls are still being answered by our full-time ethicists and part-time ethicists. So you'll always get someone who's a fully trained ethicist on the phone if you're going to talk with us there. But if you just have a question and you're not sure, you know, send us an email. We're building up the staff to be able to handle a larger volume and, and we're happy to assist. You, you know, no question is too small. No moral scruple is, is something that should hold you back. We'll give you the guidance that you need. 
Well, fantastic. So when we were discussing this interview and preparing, you mentioned that there's a presentation that you do for medical students on IVF and related procedures that is, and I think you said the highlight of your year. I loved hearing that. Why is this (laughs) such important work for you? Yeah, absolutely. So that particular presentation I give once a year is for the Catholic Medical Association's boot camp for medical students and residents. So it's a very unique uh, experience. It happens once a year and uh, it's just, it's very transformative for the people who participate, but also for us as the the presenters, the doctors and ethicists and uh, priests who are all presenting there because it, it brings together for a whole week, you know, an impressive group of people the people who are going through med school now or starting their residencies now, as well as the people who've been practicing Catholic doctors for 30, 40 years or more in some cases, and those who've been involved in the field of ethics like myself for a long time, trying to bring the knowledge and the training and the preparation to those med students and residents who are young Catholics at the time when they need it as they enter the field so that they're not sort of getting deep into it, making some big important decisions, and then later on down the line realizing, oh my goodness, how do I integrate my Catholic faith with what I'm trying to do? So this is an incredible opportunity to give them the formation and the knowledge that they need at a critical time uh, and the tools to be able to navigate our increasingly secular uh, culture and the med school environment, which can be very hostile now. And so for me, it's just, it's amazing because it's the one time a year where I get to spend so much time in person with young people who are our future medical professionals and giving them these these kinds of resources and the church's teachings ultimately on a question like in vitro fertilization and all the other reproductive technologies because naturally they're going to be faced with a lot of questions you know from their fellow student well you know why do you believe this or what does the church even teach about this and how do you explain or defend that and and how do you you know keep your conscience integral? How do you keep your conscience firm and solid in the face of uh, so many of these questions that, that are assailing us today? So let's let's dive right in then to those questions. What are some of the ethical quandaries in medical training for doctors and nurses specifically in this area of reproductive technologies? Yeah, well, the first one, of course, is just IVF in general, which is such a huge part of the whole fertility industry. So when it comes to how is a medical student or resident going to respond when they're going through that part of their medical training information as to you know, how do we address infertility, basically? IVF has sort of become the, the standard go-to solution for our uh, society and for part of their medical training. And so that becomes the first big question. It's, you know, over 99% of all fertility clinics are doing IVF, basically, as their primary method of assisting couples to, con- to conceive. But beyond that, there's also quite more subtle questions like, well, what about something, you know, I know IVF is wrong, but what about something subtle like, can I be involved with fertility testing? You know, Mm -hmm. like how do we do fertility testing for a couple? Something like, you know, testing a man's semen would involve something like masturbation, for example. And Mm -hmm. of course, we know that that's immoral. But wait, is it different because it's a medical purpose or not? You know, so these questions start to arise. So that would be a first kind of example of a challenge that we would uh, be able to assist with as part of that training, you know, clarifying those, those distinctions. Also with respect to fertility preservation there's, you know, somebody, young person who maybe gets diagnosed with cancer. Well, is it okay for us to do something to preserve, again, whether it's the semen or whether it's the ovary or the egg specifically? Are there distinctions? Why do we make these distinctions? And and how do we justify that as Catholics? Like, why do we say, yes, it's okay to do this, but not that, as far as even something like fertility cryopreservation would go? And so those are the the natural next steps. And then ultimately, the biggest question is, okay, again, IVF we know is wrong. You know, maybe there's some clear boundaries there. But what about all these other sort of unique interventions that are out there? There are things like gamete intrafallopian transfer or intrauterine insemination, or you're going to be using insemination from the husband so that, you know, it's not actually a donor gamete, but it is the couple's own gametes. And, you know, you start to wonder, even as a Catholic, like, well, well, on what grounds do are we able to discern and assess each of these particular methods above and beyond, well, IVF is wrong. 
you know, so that would be the the kinds of dilemmas that they might be faced with or questions they might be faced with is, you know, hey, I get that IVF is wrong, but what about all these other things? Well, let's tackle a few of those specifically that you mentioned. So let's let's take a case of uh, a young person who maybe even is not married yet um, and diagnosed with cancer and wanting to preserve their fertility. What advice would you give um, male or female to this young person who is looking forward and hoping one day to have children with their future spouse? What would you say? Sure. A a great question. And so what I would say is, first, we'll take the case of the young woman, which is in a sense simpler. So for the case of the young woman, the church is very clear that we can't cryopreserve eggs for the purpose of a future in vitro fertilization, right? Mm -hmm. Or any future action that would be a way of conceiving a child by a means other than conjugal intercourse. So cryopreserving an egg at this stage, there's no clear path to how you would use that egg in order to achieve a pregnancy later on down the line. There's one technique that is, I would say, still open-ended. There's not a clear answer, and there's still a bit of debate about this, which is called a lower tubal ovum transfer that may be legitimate. So in light of that, what I would say is, well, you, you'll you need to consider, you know, whether you're going to preserve an ovum or a series of ova or not, you're going to have to consider the risks, first of all, of the, the stimulation, the hyperstimulation to procure those, which may present to you certain risks that are not going to be adequately explained to you ahead of time. So there's a risk there to yourself you need to be clear about. You don't even know if you're ever going to be married. So there's another unknown. But and then the next thing is, okay, well, you're also doing all of this and taking these risks of the ovarian hyperstimulation, et cetera, on the possibility that maybe there'd be clarification that this intervention could be legitimate. So it's a lot of ifs and maybes, Mm -hmm. right? And so what I would say is because I'm not in a position to tell you what you have to do or not do, I'm in a position to form your conscience. So I'm going to say, look, there's not explicit prohibition on it. If you wanted to cryopreserve an ovum for that purpose and you judge there was a serious enough reason to you could do so provided you're clear that you're never going to use it for any uh, or other clearly prohibited procedure. And that's the extent of like the low bar of what I would say, (laughs) right? There's a sort of an ethical minimum as it were. Then I would also say, but you should consider the bigger picture of what are you trying to achieve? And, you know, how much are you going to entrust yourself to divine providence in a situation like this as well? Is it really worth? And what are you going to do in all those intervening years where that ovum is cryopreserved? Are you going to trust the industry to keep that ovum distinctly yours and not mix it up? For example, you know, a lot of laboratory problems can arise with these sorts of mix up about how labeling is done and these sorts of things. So you also run that risk. So I'm just going to give them, you know, additional things to consider. I'm not going to be able to say, well, no, you can't do it. And I'm also not going to be able to say, yes, you definitely should do it. But I'm going to make you hopefully think about these different factors that might not be on your mind and that other people aren't going to tell you with that absolute bar of, in any case, the church is completely clear. You can never use uh, this or cryopreserve an ovum for that purpose. But what I would recommend is looking into the possibility of an ovary cryopreservation, the whole Mm -hmm. ovary. And that's something that's actually already being done. And it's not easy to find. But it is definitely the kind of technology I would hope will continue to develop that would encourage a person in that situation to look into. Maybe there's a doctor in their vicinity or a clinic in their facility, you know, vicinity who's working on this kind of research where they actually might take the whole ovary, cryopreserve it, and then be able to put it back into you after your cancer treatment. And then you would be able to have normal intercourse after that once you're married, right? And and you would have preserved your fertility that way. Of course, there are still always the risks of cryopreservation, et cetera. But that would be a completely morally legitimate option with none of the concerns that go with handling gametes specifically like the ova. For the man, on the other hand, as a single man, there's really not any way to procure the semen legitimately for cryopreservation because the only ways that uh, moral theologians today are generally agreed could be legitimate to procure semen all occur within the context of a conjugal act. That is using a perforated condom or other collection device during a conjugal act so that you actually have a completed conjugal act and a portion of that ejaculate can be retained and then potentially tested for infertility reasons, for example. But you wouldn't be doing it to cryopreserve that semen because, well, what do you do with cryopreserved semen? The only thing you can do there unlike in the case of the the ovum, 
The only thing you can do with the semen is if you're going to put semen in, that's going to be an insemination. Mm -hmm. And any of the, any insemination is going to automatically be immoral based on the fact that you have replaced a conjugal act. Mm -hmm. So you'd be effectively procuring semen in the case of a single man. You'd be procuring the semen when the person's not even married. Mm -hmm. And then essentially putting that semen into a future wife years down the line. And that act would clearly not flow from an act of conjugal intercourse between husband and wife. It would have been, again, that semen procured years in the past is being used to impregnate her effectively in the future and is not flowing from their act of conjugal love together. So then I think this would be a good point to to kind of step back from the specifics and look at the context of reproductive technologies and these things we're talking about. So in your presentation, you observe that the attitude behind the use of reproductive technologies is often one of demanding a baby. And it's also rooted in a misunderstanding of marriage. Could you flush out those claims for us? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So there, so yeah, key thing to understand when you take a step back is that all of the church's teaching on this topic of assisted reproduction comes down to the simple notion that a child is always a gift to be received and never something to be demanded, created, or produced. And that's sort of just the, if you want to take it to the very basic, basic level, that's the fundamental key here is that a child should always be received as a gift, as the fruit of an act of love between husband and wife, which is the conjugal act. And so anything other than that is going to have ethical problems. And so as soon as you start to separate out and say, okay, well, you know, we, what, what is marriage? What is marriage for? And then, and then you say, well, it's because we want to get a child and we want to obtain that child. And you say, well, I'm going to get married so I can have children. And that's really, you know, your, your end game or your end goal is to get a child you're missing the mutual self-giving that's required, right? It's not about just getting, it's about giving. And it's a, a spouse is giving to one another. Mm -hmm. And when the spouses give themselves to one another in a mutual gift of the conjugal act, a child may result. Mm -hmm. That may result is the gift. And so, you know, when the couple's expressing their mutual spousal love through a conjugal act, they may be blessed in that, in that instance with a child that results from the conjugal act and is in effect the embodiment of that very personal act of, of, of love that they just expressed. Outside of that, so if we start to instead understand marriage as just the way to get something, like this, this is my way to get babies, mm -hmm. then if a baby doesn't come, there's the risk of starting to think, wait, well, I, I should, I have to have a baby. I have a right to a baby because I got married because I wanted to have children and now I'm not having children and I have a right to have children because I got married. But actually marriage is ordered to procreation. It's true. We say that the churches always say that it's clear marriage is ordered to procreation, but it's not the only thing it's ordered to. It's ordered to the mutual support and unity of husband and wife, as well as to procreation ultimately. And that procreation and unity are what we call the two meanings of the conjugal act that we find expressed throughout the church's teachings, in particular in Humanae Vitae, when it talks about contraception and how that violates the unity, uh, unitive and procreative meetings. And so in vitro fertilization just, does just the opposite. It's the flip side. It's, you know, it's instead of sex without babies, it's babies without sex. And so, you know, long story short, the misunderstanding of marriage that, that can cause these problems is when we start to think of marriage as my way of getting a baby, and therefore I have a right to a baby because I'm married. The thing we have a right to when we're married is actually the conjugal act. And that's the the way that we have to change our paradigm. You know, the way that we think about this is when you get married, you have a right to one another, which is you have a right to a conjugal act as spouses. That's it. The end. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so when you engage in conjugal acts, which is what you do have a right to as spouses, you may also have a child, but you may not, depending on on how things flow from there. But the thing that you do have the right to is your conjugal unity your, as husband and wife, not necessarily to the child. In fact, on the flip side, Dignitas Personae and D Donum Vitae, the church's two major documents that talk about this, would talk more about the child's rights and how the child's rights actually determine your duties as parents and as a married couple. In other words, because the child is so important, so precious, so valuable, so unique, every child has a right to be conceived gestated, born within and brought up within marriage and to be the fruit of a conjugal act of love between 
uh, mother and father. So, so it actually is the flip again there as well. It's not, what do I have a right to as a parent? And then maybe I have a right to a baby, so I have to demand this baby. But rather, any child, any human being ever has a right to be conceived in a particular way through a genuine self-giving love of mother and father in the context of marriage. And, and because that child is so precious, there's a right to this way of being conceived and brought up within marriage that's there to protect them, to, to nurture them, and to ensure that they are uh, fully respected as children and as children of God. I can really imagine these things ruffling some feathers, the idea that it's the child that has the rights or the idea that it's not that we have rights to a baby, but that actually our spouse has rights to the conjugal act. I can imagine some people feeling very, I guess, put upon by that phrasing. Um, do you have anything more to say about that? Yeah. I mean, we can, we can talk for quite a while, but yeah. Well, one thing is certainly it is, it is shocking, you know, to many people to hear it put in those terms because we don't hear those terms anymore. I mean, one way, if if we were asking the question of, well, how do you convey the message in a way that maybe isn't so legal <laughs> to talk mm -hmm. about rights and duties, <laughs> right. right? You can talk also in terms of, again, the beauty and the meaning of what it means to join together as a couple. What it, what does love truly mean for a husband and wife? You know, if you wanted to look at it in those terms, and it's that complete and mutual gift of self, my whole person, you know, each spouse giving his or her whole person to the other. And the way that that's expressed physically is through the conjugal act. And this mm -hmm. is, you know, John Paul II, theology of the body, you know, it's just amazing stuff. This is, you know, one, a better way perhaps of conveying it to audiences that might not be as, as, or that might be put off a bit more by the, the rights and duties language, right? This is really more about how do we live and respect one another as full persons who truly love and completely give one another to each other and who also love and respect any child that might be that might result so that we don't want to be we don't want to put ourselves in a relationship of dominion over mm -hmm. a child where we are sort of forcibly creating a child according to some method or technique or technology but rather we want a child to be a natural result that flows from our beautiful self-gift as husband and wife, mm -hmm. you know, and we want that child in that sense to be a, a true and natural manifestation that flows directly from this act of intercourse between husband and wife. So it can be pretty tricky, though, to navigate the specifics of all of the fertility treatments that are available and know whether a specific intervention is licit. And you propose a specific question that asks as a litmus test for determining that. Could you share that with us and maybe go through some examples? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So this is actually the the question that I pose is actually one that's given to us directly by Donum Vitae itself uh, from 1987, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is this question of does the technology assist or replace the conjugal act. That's our basic fundamental litmus test for any particular technology or intervention that we might want to apply in an effort to assist a couple with achieving pregnancy. And if the technique we're talking about actually assists the conjugal act in either in accomplishment of the conjugal act or in the procreative potential associated with the conjugal act, then it's fine, wonderful, and legitimate. If, on the other hand, the technique we're talking about actually replaces that conjugal act, so it's it's sort of going around it, or it's just taking something from it and then doing a new separate act to, to create the child independently of that conjugal act, that's what we call a replacing or a substituting for the conjugal act. So it's, it's no longer just something that's helping the couple in achieving that conjugal act or in uh, having a pregnancy result from that conjugal act, but rather it is having recourse to some outside step that takes us outside or around the conjugal union of husband and wife. So does it assist or does it replace? And what? Assist or replace the conjugal act. Right. So I have written about Donum Vitae's prohibition of IVF in my book, Reclaiming Motherhood, and expanded on the idea that producing a child with the biological material of someone other than your spouse constitutes a sort of reproductive infidelity. But it's also true, as you explain in your presentation, that 
any extracorporeal fertilization, meaning outside of the body, is troublesome, even within marriage. Can you articulate the church's thinking there? Yes, certainly. So this is what the church refers to in Donum Vitae as extracorporeal, as you mentioned, fertilization. When conceptions happening outside of the body, in essence, outside of the womb of the mother, this is considered to be an instance of an artificial reproductive technology. In other words, conception is not happening as a result of or or directly flowing from the conjugal union of husband and wife. Something's being removed, right? So this, in order for that conception to happen outside of the womb, well, the semen or the ovum or both have to be removed in order to achieve a conception outside of there. And an example of this would be apart from, yeah, well, in vitro fertilization actually is itself a classic example of extracorporeal. So in vitro fertilization can be both what we call heterologous, which means that you have gametes from people who are outside of the couple, like non-married spouse is a donor, essentially, is giving a gamete, be it sperm or ovum, and that's called heterologous fertilization. But it's also always and necessarily outside the body. It's in vitro, meaning in glassware. So basically, even if you're using the couple's own gametes, their own sperm, their own eggs to achieve this fertilization, well, you need a third party. You need somebody to take those gametes and put them together in that Petri dish or in that you know glass tube. And when you do that, you're introducing somebody else and additional human acts into the dynamic of how that human person comes to existence. It's no longer a person who's coming into existence as a direct result of conjugal union of husband and wife. It's we're taking some materials, some biological materials from husband and wife, and where somebody else is putting them together in a Petri dish and making that new person come into existence that way, and then maybe putting it back into the mother's womb. So essentially this, this great, this incredible, this sacred, this unique act of the conception of a new human person is happening in a place that's not the mother's womb. And that is what the church sees as a serious problem that makes it immoral and disrespectful to the child. Again, the child's right to be born in and, and brought up within that maternal uterine environment, that womb, mm-hmm. that most sacred and secure of places. And yet we're exposing that child to a manipulative environment outside of that womb, even if it's the couple's own gametes. Yeah. And and that certainly would not meet that litmus test of that question that we talked Correct. about. It definitely is not assisting the marital act that is going around it. So we've gone in depth on this podcast with other guests on um, NAPRO surrogacy, but there are a couple of lesser known techniques. I mean, you mentioned one of them, gift, IUI, artificial insemination by the husband. Could you walk us through these and spell out the ethics in these cases? So gamete intrafallopian transfer essentially means that in the, the sperm and egg are procured. They are put together in a Petri dish, essentially. They are, or, and then ultimately put into a catheter. They're separated by an air bubble if we're going to follow what a lot of traditional Catholic thinking would would talk about on this issue because we have to have to specify that gift can be different and has has been different in the secular context versus what Catholic moral theologians talk about. So so what actually happens with gift may not be this way, but what was discussed in the Catholic moral literature for for some time in recent decades was this notion that, hey, let's take a sperm and an egg and put them in a catheter separated by an air bubble so they can't actually meet each other. So fertilization will not happen outside the body. Then we're going to take this and we're going to put this by, you know, we're going to push through the catheter, the sperm and the egg into the woman's fallopian tube. So gamete intrafallopian transfer. We're not transferring an embryo, an already conceived child. We're transferring two gametes, the sperm and the egg, and we're putting them into that fallopian tube. And so by this, the logic was, hey, well, then it's intracorporeal, right? It's actually fertilization is going to happen in the woman's body. And it is the husband's uh, gametes and the the wife's gametes. We're assuming, okay, that's a a caveat there, homologous gift. Homologous meaning both the, the husband and the wife's gametes, not an outside gamete. And this is something that... Um, a number of Catholic moral theologians argued would be legitimate, potentially, if you could procure the semen, 
in a legitimate way, which, as I said before, some argued it could be procured through using a perforated condom or other collection device during a regular conjugal act, so that some semen is still going through for the accomplishment of a conjugal act, but some is retained in the collection device, and then that semen is used to to put into the fallopian tube later with the uh, the ovum. Now that also involves the ovarian hyperstimulation ahead of time to get the egg from the woman as well and then to put it back in. So as you can see, things get a bit complicated here. <laughs> but so so all those things in place, gamete and transfer would be that essentially. We're going to assume that you get the semen in a legitimate way. We're going to uh, assume that you keep a separation air bubble so that they can't conceive outside the body. And then a technician is helping to transfer that gamete, those two gametes into the fallopian tube with the idea that you're circumventing some of the problems that might be happening in the cervix and so forth by going straight into the fallopian tube, which is where conception normally happens. This there's not a definitive teaching on this, right? There's never been a final word from the church explicitly about this technique. I would argue that this is also not legitimate, in my personal opinion. I think it fails the criterion of assisting versus replacing. Mm -hmm. I think that it actually does end up replacing as well. Even if you manage to maintain the air bubble, I think all of the, you're still having recourse to a subsequent human action other than the conjugal union of husband and wife in order to bring this these two gametes into the fallopian tube for fertilization in the woman's body so by you know that sort of essential definition of what constitutes artificial fertilization in catholic teaching i would say it seems to fail that although there are as i said there's not a definitive you know explicit condemnation of that procedure i agree uh, with other, you. I think, yeah. I think if if you have to procure the biological materials that are necessary already you're you're doing something that's clearly not the conjugal gift of self that is supposed to be taking place that is the you know the expression of love in total self self donation between husband and me very unlike the the gift of the father to the son and then that then the Holy Spirit proceeds right. from it that that it's supposed to be the image of. So I, I agree with you there. Yeah. And you're and you're also again necessarily involving a technician, a third party mm -hmm. in some fashion in order to accomplish all of this. So, you know, now the so the next thing though is the artificial insemination mm -hmm. by husband. And there are a variety of techniques there. One of those techniques is referred to as intrauterine insemination, and it's usually done in a clinic. And this, similar to gift, will involve procuring the semen ahead of time, but not the ovum. So this is just procuring of semen. It is going to involve actually then placing the semen. Sometimes it will involve centrifuging and purifying the semen to try to get a better sample for placement at the into the uterus, so intrauterine insemination. And then they'll have a catheter to essentially push that semen into place in, in the uterus. This again involves, you know, you got to go to a clinic and there's a third party individual who's going to push that plunger to push the semen in. Although they do have a thing where they encourage husbands to be the one who actually pushes the plunger. I think that actually emphasizes, again, in my opinion, I would say that's not legitimate. It seems to be another replacement. Again, you're involving a third party. Again, you're you know taking something out to then put something back in. So that would be my my assessment on that. But but again, it hasn't been explicitly clarified. And we'll find documents like, for example, the, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has a resource document on reproductive technologies where they mentioned that that this particular method of intrauterine insemination is not resolved, right? It's listed as an, an unresolved question. So, you know, for the sake of integrity, again, uh, we're helped to form people's consciences. Okay. I will tell people that, but then of course I can also give my own opinion and explanation as to why mm -hmm. I don't think that that works. Well, what if somebody um, pushes back and says, well, what if the husband is a doctor, say the right. husband is a fertility specialist, would he then be able to make use of these other methods since he wouldn't there wouldn't be a third party right. it would be the doctor he is right the doctor. yeah great How, question what would be the assessment there yeah so i i would respond to that by essentially saying that you he may be the same person but it's not the same act by which conception is occurring so the conjugal act which is the manifestation the bodily manifestation of the couple's love for one another that total and complete mutual self-gift that's the conjugal act but what he's doing later is a whole new act it's a whole different mm -hmm. act. 
and and of course the the whole logic here about artificial reproduction is that the the conception of the child is supposed to flow from and to be the result of the couple's spousal union in the conjugal act. So even if it's the same guy doing it, mm -hmm. it's still a new act mm -hmm. and therefore a replacement, as it were. Even though you're using some materials from a conjugal act, you've effectively created a whole new act that's not the spousal act that is the, the cause of the conception here. Yeah, and there, there are certain acts, <clears throat> I think, that are appropriate to certain roles that we have in people's lives, like certain relationships, certain acts are appropriate. And so I would think that for, for the husband, you know, his, the person who inseminates a wife should be a husband, but he should be acting in his role. And like you said, complete the act as a husband. Whereas if you medicalize it and take it into that very clinical role, then, and he becomes sort of playing his doctor role in right. his relationship with his wife, where he should be playing the husband role. I think that that also correct would would be part of the problem it makes me think of um, i don't know if you've heard of norman barwin and some of these fertility doctors who yes. violated women's rights by using their own semen to yes. inseminate women and the women were articulating even though they went in for this procedure and they were hoping that the doctor would do this they felt like they had been raped because sure. because the doctor <laughs> had used his own he had deceived them and and so i think that 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 moral sensibility that those women are voicing and articulating kind of says something to us there about the proper role of doctor versus the proper role of husband in those examples. Absolutely. Great points. What advice do you have for aspiring doctors and nurses who are going into this field that, as you've said, is becoming increasingly hostile to the idea of conscience? Well, I mean, first, I think it's important that they take their faith very seriously, mm -hmm. which means not just the obvious, you know, first and foremost, prayer life, sacramental life, et cetera, but also the formation of conscience peace. So in other words, they should definitely familiarize themselves with the catechism, especially in those areas that apply to the moral life and to biomedical issues. So a number of actually biomedical issues are addressed in the catechism. And, you know, so that that's sort of step number one, the basics. But beyond that, which is, you know, fairly evident, I would say that they need to understand that we have to connect with people who can help us. I think that's a place where we are right now, where it's critical that we start to build broader community with people who take the faith seriously, who know what they're talking about, who've lived situations that they may be facing. So for example, it would be very wise for, for anyone entering into these fields, uh, medical students, residents, et cetera, to connect with groups like the Catholic Medical Association that I mentioned that runs this boot camp, to consider participating in that boot camp, for example, which can then connect them with fellow med students and residents around the whole country and even from out of the country, some of them. But, you know, so building those networks and those relationships so that you can know that you're not alone mm -hmm. and you can start to find the additional resources you need to address the complex, you know, nuances of your situation. Because, of course, it's one thing to read the catechism and say, well, that's all well and good. But, you know, what about my case? And how does this work in this case? And what does it mean? You know, just because I, I understand that sterilization is immoral, what about my role cooperating with the sterilization of a woman following a pregnancy, you know, after a delivery, for example? And those are some of the questions we get in our free consultation service, for example. So we we help with, with a lot of these sorts of cooperation and conscience questions. So certainly, of course, again, knowing that we exist and that they can call us or they can write to us and ask us these kinds of questions and we can direct them to further resources. There are also groups like for, for healthcare professionals like nurses, there's a Catholic Nurses Association. They should check it out, see if there's a local chapter. Can they get involved with that? You know, NCBC, the organization I work for, also has student memberships that people could could get and to start access to our resources. We have publications and, and other sorts of resources as well beyond our free consultation service. So they, you really need to get equipped is the long story mm -hmm. short, right? Equipped from the, the standpoint of having the knowledge and the resources and the connections and relationships to, to be able to sustain this challenging path forward, because that's what it is. It's increasingly confrontational. It's increasingly secular. It's, as you said, increasingly hostile to conscience. You know, there are all sorts of calls and efforts already to just strip any kind of conscience objections from medicine right. and to reduce medical professionals to essentially, you know, medical dispensers of whatever people want them to do, mm -hmm. which is a terrible dehumanization in itself of the medical professionals, mm -hmm. you know, turning them basically into machines. Yeah. What this 
reminds me of actually kind of in an analogous way is <clears throat> where priests used to be kind of held up on this pedestal. <clears throat> and then we had all of the you know, the sex abuse scandals. And now at this point, they don't enjoy this same kind of social status that maybe they once did. And so it's it's definitely been a very purifying thing. And I'm, I'm glad everything came into the light. But now it it takes a lot of courage if you have a vocation to the priesthood. Like It takes a lot of courage yes. to say yes, yes to that and to be a, a living witness of your faith, giving your whole life like that. And I think that that's also becoming true in the medical field, especially for you know nurses and OBGYNs who are, I think, pressured for sure, and sometimes losing their jobs over this the idea of a of not wanting to do abortions or not wanting to participate in or facil- facilitate abortion. Or I've even heard of some medical professionals losing their positions, OBs, because they didn't want to write prescriptions for contraceptives anymore. Yes. And that's, yes. That's, so I, I think it takes an enormous amount of courage and fortitude to go forward as a medical professional. And so yes. do you think do you think it's it's still worth it for somebody who's a medical student right now, you know, knowing that they're going to be in more of a fight than maybe they expected when they were a little kid thinking, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to deliver babies. <laughs> what would you say to that person who's looking forward at their medical education? Thinking, wow, I have to fight me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think obviously every case is unique. So, you know, the, across the board advice is always hard to give, but I would definitely say by and large, it's still worth it. Right. There may still there may be some cases where, hey, you know, you, you realize what the climate is like and maybe that's just not what you're called to right now. Mm-hmm. But I'd say for the for the majority, I would hope and I pray that mm-hmm. they still feel called, that our Lord gives them the strength and courage they need. And and I would I would try to encourage them by saying, that's why we're here. You're you know, right. we're here. There are these other associations like the Catholic Medical Association, Catholic Nurses Association, and especially it's also important to mention in this context, legal help. Right. So so something that has just become absolutely critical is starting to become aware of your legal rights under in terms of conscience and also familiar with uh, pro bono uh, law firms who might defend your conscience rights Mm. and your religious liberty as a Catholic. And there are a number of those. And we often will give uh, those names out to people who contact us for these very sorts of questions about conscience and conflicts with their employers. So so I think more than ever, the the legal question is becoming paramount because it's, you know, it's nice to talk about things in the abstract and say what you should or shouldn't do, you know, morally in general. It's another thing to say, yeah, but what can I actually do? And what if my employer, you know, is 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 going to kick me out or my medical residency is going to kick me out? Like what right. rights, if any, do I have and who can support me, inform me or or defend me if need be? So becoming familiar with what those are. So some of them, the Alliance Defending Freedom, Thomas More Society, Beckett Fund, those are just three of them that that are the kinds of law firms out there doing this kind of work, defending religious liberty and conscience rights. Yeah, absolutely. I think just knowing that that they're not alone and then being able yes. to connect with people who are facing the same thing, seasoned professionals who have faced the same thing yes. and the people who are really on the front lines defending people who face yes. those same challenges. That's great. And I would just add one last thing, which is that it may be that the traditional medical landscape and the traditional medical pathway are shifting a bit mm-hmm. in the sense that because we have a number of seasoned medical you know, professionals, faithful Catholics, et cetera, who are realizing the extent of the problem, who've been through it themselves, who, who, who are now where they are, and many of these are you know, with the Catholic Medical Association, for example, I'm confident that we are building up new opportunities that may be awaiting these medical students, residents, and other healthcare professionals, nurses, you know, once they get to a point where they're looking for employment, well, maybe there's going to be, you know, a revitalized Catholic healthcare system that is, you know, beefing up its Catholic identity and looking for those people who are passionate and, and you know, solid Catholics to come and work in their facilities or new private practices that are, again, run by Catholics and they're, they want to do it with integrity and that sort of thing. So, I mean, and, and Christians in general, I'm sure this is happening as well, obviously speaking specifically for Catholics, given, you know, the subject of our podcast, et cetera. But but I think it's happening. And I think that, you know, there will be more opportunities, even if we don't see them right now, because those are also in the works. You know, there's right. an upcoming Catholic medical school that is uh, going to be starting in, in the next few years where it's going to be a, a robust, a faithful Catholic medical program and, and these sorts of things. So there's always, you know, while it may look like things are getting worse, there are also counter initiatives, as it were, or or pathways forward 
that may not fit the, the classic expectation of what you might have thought when you were, you know, in high school, what it would look like. Well, it may look different, but there's there's going to be a place for you. Right, right. Oh, that's very, very hopeful. Thank you. So what about for seasoned professionals who maybe, you know, they've gone through many years of practice and they're very proud of the fact that they're a Catholic OB and they've never done an abortion or assisted in an abortion, but then they're now waking up to the fact that maybe being a pro-life OBGYN is a little bit more broad than just avoiding abortion, for example. Um, Maybe they are thinking, what do you mean? Wait, I shouldn't write prescriptions for contraceptives or I should be careful about that. Or what do you mean I shouldn't be participating in sterilization? Wait, what? And they're waking (laughs) up to the fact that the ethical preparation that they received in medical school maybe was slim, um, at least compared to what what we have in you know the wealth we have in the Catholic tradition, what would you suggest they pursue in order to properly form their consciences going forward and prepare to act ethically in these roles, you know, in the future? Yeah. So definitely, as I mentioned before, I mean, just at a general level, you know, getting it more familiar with the literature. So, you know, joining the Catholic Medical Association, making some connections there, getting some of their publications like the Lineker Quarterly, which they put out, joining National Catholic Bioethics Center, getting our quarterly and our publications. You know, those are just general things somebody could do. But more specifically, of course, our free consultation service, right? Mm-hmm. If somebody is like, oh my gosh, I'm realizing this, you know, I never thought about this before. You know, how do I navigate this? That's the very kind of ethical question they could ask us. So like, well, mm-hmm. and we get a number of questions of that sort, actually, <laughs> where somebody is either converting to Catholicism they weren't mm-hmm. Catholic at all, or maybe they are Catholic or pro-life and doing some things, but then realizing, wait a minute, this other piece I never thought about before. And they ask us for advice and direction on that, which we, of course, will, will provide. That's our free service. So, I mean, I, I would want to encourage anybody to do that as a first step. If they're not sure where to go, just call mm-hmm. our free service and, and or, you know, email us or whatever. But, but also NCBC has a certification program, for example, mm-hmm. which is actually probably very fitting for that kind of demographic. You know, somebody who's an established professional who's been working for some time wants to become more familiar with church teaching and our certification program is a one-year program you know that you can do which will basically give you you know the the broad overview with some nitty-gritty of each of the major areas of catholic moral teaching from cooperation with evil to euthanasia and assisted suicide and all the you know these kinds of abortion complications of pregnancy uh, contraception sterilization you kind of get the whole shebang in a year through the ncbc and of course you always have a ongoing possibility of free consults with us if you find a situation you're not familiar with. So that would definitely be something that that could assist them with forming their conscience and understanding what the teaching is and what the limits might be and how they could navigate within their particular circumstances as they come to to, to further appreciate the, these other areas of church teaching. And they might find some more that they didn't realize uh, as well when they do so. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else we haven't already discussed that you think listeners should know? Yeah. I actually, I was, I think it's very important, especially because we got a little bit technical in, in some mm-hmm. places here. And, and actually my presentation for the medical students is very technical mm-hmm. because I really need them to understand as, you know, they, they generally have a very sort of outcomes based look of, at reality, you know, being a science majors and coming into medicine, it's kind of about outcomes and outcomes and outcomes. Whereas ethics is more about, you know, the interior life and it's about the meaning of actions. And so I, you know, really spend a lot of time trying to hammer out and parse out details, but it's really important to understand the pastoral dimension, right? And to remember that, especially when we're dealing with infertility, which is of course, what's, what's behind this whole discussion of assisted reproductive technologies is infertility, which is, which is a great cross and which is something that, you know, we want people to know that it's not just about the technicalities, Mm -hmm. that there are ministries out there, which we would also direct people to through our consultation service, like there's a great ministry called Springs in the Desert. Mm-hmm. There's another one called Hannah's Tears, which are specifically targeted to people who are struggling with infertility. And it provides that accompaniment component, that prayerful support component, you know, that meaningful personal dimension of all of this over and beyond what might technically be legitimate and what, you know, the, the sort of technicalities of church teaching as it were. Mm-hmm. And we also have a a podcast episode that we did. Dr. Joe Zalot, who's one of my colleagues, does the Bioethics on Air podcast, where he interviewed Dr. Marie Meany on the the question of the cross of infertility. This was Mm -hmm. episode one. So I'd encourage listeners to to go listen to that episode in particular for more on just this. In the show notes. Yeah. Okay. 
And then uh, finally, and most importantly, prayer, you know, the, the saints were having recourse to those patron saints of infertility, like St. Anne, St. Elizabeth, mm -hmm. St. Catherine of Sweden, St. John, St. Gerard, St. Hannah, you know, these are the invaluable heavenly resources, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Over and beyond uh, the the technicalities and the, the conscience formation, educational pieces, we, we have to remember that there's that deep question of meaning and of these questions of why and how do we get through, even when we can wrap our minds around, okay, what might be morally legitimate or not, there still remain these questions, these existential questions and these these crosses that, you know, the Lord may lift or he may not in some cases. So I, I would want to end on that note that I encourage everyone to, to pray, to have recourse to these ministries, as well as to prayer and in particular to the patrons and of infertility. Right. Well, I can't think of a better note to end on than, than just lifting our hearts in prayer up to heaven. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. My pleasure, Samantha.